Okay, so uh, welcome to back. Welcome back to the Canadian Music Expo Spring Equinox. Uh, happy to introduce uh, Alan Cross, who's going to be uh, moderating a session with Greg Godovitz, uh, member of Gado, uh, founding member of Gado, and uh, going to run through uh, Greg's career over the last uh, well number of years. I don't want to say Greg, but it is your fifty-seven years in the music Unbelievable. business. Unbelievable, fantastic! And uh, it's your birthday today. Seventy years old. So awesome stuff. So I'll oh, yeah. turn it over to Alan. Alan Thank will uh, do the moderating. If you have any questions for uh, Greg or Alan, for that matter, feel free to put them in the chat uh, button on the side. And uh, I'll be back uh, uh, a little bit later, or uh, we'll try to come back and, and uh, say uh, say my thanks and so on. So anyways, uh, turn it over to you, Alan, and thanks, for, uh, thanks again. Thanks, Mark. Good Thank luck you. with this. All right, well, first of all, let's do the happy birthday thing. 70 years old. I am, and I've been playing music since 1964 when I was 13, so that's uh, 57 years. I am sure glad my brother brought home that Beatles album because I heard it and I went, that's what I want to do for the rest did of my life. Did you see the Beatles on Ed Sullivan in 64? I did, and I saw them live. Where did you see them live? In Toronto? Maple Leaf Gardens, yep. Went down, uh, we, the King Eddie Hotel was where they were staying. And of course it was under siege. And uh, we saw a, a doorman at the side of the building and he said, you guys look like you're not gonna cause any trouble. They're coming out the back door in about five minutes in a paddy wagon. So we went to the back door and sure enough, the tin door opened up, paddy wagon comes out. My friend and I jump on the back of it, screaming, hello Beatles in there. And a big cop grabbed me around the waist and tore me off the paddy wagon with his finger. I bet you I know how far he got. I bet you I know the name of the cop. Have you? Okay, I'm going to tell you the story. All right, and you you right. can tell me what you think of it. So the Beatles come in to this is '66, yes. '64. '64. Okay. They played here '64, '65, '66. Two shows a day. Okay, so there was a time, and I, I think this was 66, or maybe it may have been 65, where uh, they were assigned an OPP detail, and they got this guy from the Aurora, Aurora Detachment, and he was a, a big, brawny, you know, jarhead kind of cop that really didn't understand these kids and their loud music and their screaming and all the rest of it. And, you know, that kind of attitude to mix with what the Beatles were all about was kind of a, a weird, you know, juxtaposition but over the course of the day that they were together they kind of won the guy over and softened him up later uh paul mccartney's thinking about doing a new album with the with the band and they want to do this this pseudonymous group with a different name so that's where sergeant pepper's lonely hearts club band yeah. came from well it turns out that this guy that they charmed over from the aurora detachment of the opp his name was sergeant robert pepper oh no kidding so and did you give paul the badge no, the badge came in 64 when they stopped at the airport and uh, some RCMP guys and OPP guys were there and, and just gave them a patch. There, there were five or six patches that they got at that time. They just threw them all into a bag. And then what happened was they took them all home. And then when it came time to do the costumes for uh, Sergeant Pepper in early 1967, they went to a theatrical supply company and they took this big bag of crap that they had been given by fans over the last three years. Somebody found the OPP badge, slapped it on Paul. Right, uh, actually, I, you talk about them at the airport. I had I have a picture in my collection of three of the Beatles. I don't think Ringo's in it. Uh, just outside of the airplane, just after they landed in Toronto and somebody had taken it and gave me a copy knowing that I'm, you know, I collect Beatles memorabilia, but they, they were great days. I mean, in 65, uh, Brian Pilling the, would go on to be in flood with me. We were outside of the King Eddie Hotel once again uh, when the Stones were in town. And uh, we were in the front door and all the girls were around the back and the sides. All of a sudden this limousine pulls up and we turn around and Brian Jones is walking towards us out of the front door. And, you know, I'm 14 years old and like, just freaking. I mean, there's one of the Rolling Stones right beside us. And this girl jumped on him. And then all of a sudden there was a phalanx of cops around us. It was the two of us and Brian. And then 
he's being choked to death by this chick and he's got a cigarette and he goes, will somebody please get this bird off my back? <laughs> you know? And we, we could see all the arms coming in and I thought we were actually part of the mania for two minutes, you know? So you know, w one of the ways I was going to introduce you before we got off into the birthday thing was a uh, Canadian music veteran and author. There aren't too many people. Yes, there aren't too many people who have those two uh, job descriptions that go along with them. Uh, so you've got two books now? Two, yeah. I got uh, the first one, uh, Travels with My Amp, and then the new one, uh, Up Close and Uncomfortable. And I am actually writing the third volume as we speak, which I'm calling The Idiots Trilogy Part 4. <laughs> So let's go back to Travels with My Amp. That's a pretty much straight ahead memoir, yes? Yeah, yeah. It, it starts 64. Uh, when when I started, I'll show you briefly a photograph here that will put things in perspective. Uh, 64 to 84. Uh, so it covers a, a lot of ground. But that, let me see if we can see that. There's the perfect Brian Jones. I'm 13 years old there. You got the haircut. I, got, I had perfect, be I have wavy hair now, it's waving goodbye, but I had a perfect beetle haircut back in the day. And uh, you know, so this book is straight sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And then I realized I hadn't written a number of other things. So when I wrote Up Close and Uncomfortable, I put short stories in it. Uh, there's a lot of music stuff in it, of course, because I mean, I can't get away from that. But then I realized I had nothing about my eight years in Calgary when I lived out there and then coming back to Toronto. And that's when I realized that I've got to write another 400 pages to catch up on the rest of it. You know? So I'm working you, on that. You realize how few people have an autobiography in three volumes. <laughs> that's... Well, you know, I'm just so gosh darn important, Alan, that, uh, you know, I just, <laughs> I figured you were going to write a book about me. So I'll write three about I, me. I, I, but I mean... I, I don't I don't take any prisoners in these books. I mean, there's a lot of people. I called them up and told them when I was writing, they said, if you print that, I'm going to sue you. And to a man or woman, a half an hour later, they said, no, no, print it. It's a great story. Of course it's a great story. And it was a, one of the big problems with Canadian music is that up until recently, very few people have documented it. You know, there haven't been a lot of biographies and autobiographies and monographs on the history of Canadian music. That's changing. But there was that. Well, you know, we're. Where this started for me was Dave Bedini from the Real Statics called me up. He was writing a book called On a Cold Road. And he came to my house. And then when the book came out and I got a copy, I had 22 pages of my stories in his book. And Peter Goddard uh, was writing for the Toronto Star at the time. And he reviewed it. And I was sitting there one Saturday morning reading the review. And it said it was a good review because, you know, Peter can be a servant. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said... Most of the stories in the in the book are mundane, with the exception of this guy, who should clearly write his own book. And I started working on it that day. Really? Yeah, that's how that came about. So let's just so I owe it to Peter and to Dave Bedini. Let's let's go quickly here. So thirteen, you get your first guitar. Uh, your brother brought it home. You become a Beatles and Stones fan. How do we get the flood? Well, when I when I went to high school where that picture was taken in grade nine in my class in my homeroom was Brian Pilling, who would become the great songwriter, guitar player of flood. And I remember we had a grade nine day where the, anybody over grade nine could torment you if you were in grade nine. And of course I already had a beetle haircut. Brian was a bit of a greaser in those days, but he combed his hair down for this twerp day, they called it. And then I remember, you know, he had a beetle haircut all of a sudden and I did and I remember us running across the field out and back, pretending we were the Beatles getting chased in a hard day's <laughs> night and then falling, collapsing on the ground. Instant best friends. My brother's coming back from England, he says. A couple months later, Ed shows up. Ed comes into this restaurant in Scarborough two hours late because the bus drivers wouldn't pick him up because of the really? Yeah, and we were in the restaurant for two hours and didn't realize we weren't getting served. And we were children with beetle haircuts. And then Ed came in and he says, how come you guys have been ordered? And we said, well, we've been talking about you. We, we didn't think about it. So he called the waitress over. She says, we don't serve your kind in here. And he says, I don't want my kind. I want a hamburger and I want it now. And Ed was always a no-nonsense guy. So we started a band called The Pretty Ones. Uh, there's a stretch when you look at us now, but, uh, and then we played Beatles and Stone songs, but they were already writing 
great songs as kids. Uh, then they went to England, joined Cat Stevens' band. I went through the psychedelic era playing with Eddie Schwartz, who did Hit Me With Your Best Shot, of course. Uh, and then blues guys, they taught me the Chicago blues. Then Ed and Brian came back and formed Flood, and I saw them at a high school and said, you really should let me back in the band. And eight hit records later, we had a great career. What was the end of Flood? What happened? Well, you know, my, it was a Flood was a really family oriented band. You know, the mothers and fathers were involved and all the rest of that. Uh, my mother had spoken with Brian and said, you know, my Greg is writing some really good songs. And Brian was very honest up front with her. He said, Mrs. Godovitz, with all respect, uh, Flood is my band. And uh, the, I realized when she told me that, that the writing was on the wall. Uh, songs that became Gatto standards I'd written during the Flood days, like Chantel I wrote in Quebec City. I wrote Once Again at an arena in Moncton. I wrote Cock On about the famous picture that we took uh, for Rainbow Magazine where we tucked everything in and we were naked. Uh, but they wouldn't do them. So I, I figured, well, this is the right time to leave. And there was no hard feelings. You know, they, they knew I, I had an agenda. So this is what, about 75, right? 75 is when I left the band. And they continued for, I mean, Brian, of course, developed leukemia. Uh, he died two days after his 29th birthday, which was just devastating for me because uh, I, I always felt, and to this day, uh, we had unfinished business, you know. Uh, Ed, his brother Ed and I are still best of friends. I mean, I've known him since I was 13 years old, so, and he's still going strong. So along comes Gatto uh, out of Scarborough. Was it always three piece? Yeah, we started out with uh, Marty Morin was our original drummer, who's still my friend to this day. Uh, he rejoined the band during the last little leg last year before COVID hit. Uh, we went to high school together. And uh, a guy I, I, who's a doctor of music now, uh, Gordon McKinnon, played uh, piano uh, for the band towards the end. But we did, I, I always remember the, the day I quit school, we had a, an assembly and I'd organized us doing Hey Jude, which was number one at the time. And they did it, we did it in the auditorium. So there's a couple thousand kids there. I'd arranged with the orchestra to do all the horn parts at the end, like the Beatles did on their version. And we have 2,000 kids singing na 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 na. And after that was over, I walked down to the uh, the office and said, I quit and I left. <laughs> I said, I got other things I want to do and I left school. I was 16, I think. So uh, that would be, sorry, that's 66. 66. Yeah. Okay, so. 67. Probably. Okay, so, so Gatto um, begins in 75. Um, yep. How, I, I remember, Getting into Gatto when I was living in Winnipeg, uh, it was the Who Cares album. Uh, that's the oh, one yeah. that really uh, got me in, in, into the band. But there was a, a previous band before, a previous self title record before that. How did you? Uh, okay, let's let's go through. Things are so different these days when it comes to being in a band, and getting a record deal. How did you manage to land land a deal in in seventy six or seventy seven? when a lot of Canadian music was not really well, what's the word I'm looking for? Well regarded by Canadians. Well, we, we had instant success within a month of forming when we got a opening slot at Massey Hall for Golden Earring. Up to that point, we were just a brand new band. Nobody knew us from Adam. The Gasworks, you know, you wanted to play the Gasworks, they wouldn't have us. They didn't care that I was with Flood You're and all kidding. the rest of it. Uh, yeah, they wouldn't have us. But then that night we played, opened up for Golden Earring. And the next day on Chum FM, Larry Wilson had his rock report, six o'clock rock report. And all they talked about was us. And he was mentioning songs by name uh, and just raving about the band. And the same in the newspapers. The articles mentioned that there's this new band. Next thing I know, we're playing for a week at the Gasworks, like instantly. And from Monday night till Saturday, there was a lineup to get in every night. So there was a buzz on the street that there was this new trio. I remember the guys in Streetheart coming down, uh, Paul Dean and Maddie and and, uh, and uh, Kenny Shields. They, they spent a week watching us, as did uh, uh, Black, uh, Black Sabbath, came in for a week, watched us every night. So there was a heavy buzz going on. And then 
Marty Malouish, who I'm sure you, you know, Martin Malouish, the writer, uh, he had a friend in, in Montreal that ran a record company called Fat Cat. His name was Gary Cape. And they took us to Montreal to play the mustache. And uh, they saw us and they signed us to Polydor through uh, Fat Cat Records. So we recorded the first album in, in uh, Montreal. What a lot of people forget is that in those days, Canadian music was still really, really regionalized. You know, you could be a big star in Toronto or a big star in Montreal, but not necessarily get your music played elsewhere in the country. And like I say, it wasn't until the Who Cares album came out that I started hearing about you guys in Winnipeg with songs like Sweet Thing. Yeah, well, Winnipeg was our, our biggest market outside of Toronto. But getting back to the first album, I mean, it was rough and ready. I produced it. I didn't know what I was doing, so it sounded terrible. But Under My Hat was on on that album, which was like so different from the rest of the material because Dwayne Ford played Fender Rhodes piano on it. It had that sort of Riders on the Storm groove. I remember Chum FM would not play the album. They said, this record sounds terrible. So I, being you know the, the bad boy of Canadian rock, I get two placards, uh, like a sandwich board that said, uh, Los Angeles, London, and New York were all cities where legends were created, not deflated. Chum FM is unfair to local talent. And at first they laughed at me because I was marching up and down in front of, you know, the build the Chum building on Young Street until the press came and started interviewing me and taking pictures. And they added under my hat within a week. So it was it was like that. We had to fight to get our music heard, you know. But then once of course I mean, when they started Q107, we were on Q107 every hour when Who mm -hmm. Cares came out. We were, every hour somebody played one. Well, of then them. that was, you know, Max Webster starts coming out through the through the ranks. Exactly. Uh, and there are a bunch of other bands, uh, other Toronto bands yeah. that we would hear from afar. And, and it, it took yeah. a while for, again, there was this bias against Canadian music. People forget that after the Canadian content rules came in in 1971, there was this this sense that oh you're only playing canadian music because you have to fill the quota for the radio station playlists and there was a lot that was there the was thinking. a lot of really bad music in in the 70s <laughs> which overshadowed some of the really good music that was being made and we had rush we had triumph we had you know back and turner overdrive and a bunch of other bands that that stayed in canada and tried to make a go of it domestically yeah and and you guys were were certainly one of them um i think the first time i saw gato was at the it was at the Playhouse Theater in Winnipeg. Well, that funny enough, th that's where this picture was taken. The kick, ah. I call it. Uh, a local guy named Gary Gurniak took this photograph, and I just found it in a box. And I went, I, no one ever got the kick because you know that's my leg going like over my head. I always get these karate guys going, "Where did you study?" I said, "No, this is just this is just yeah. adrenaline, pal." You know. But anyway, I used the picture without knowing who took it. And then finally, Gary reached out and said, I'm the guy that took that photograph. And I was like, oh, here comes. oh no. You know, what? And, and he was just, he says, next, when you print it again, can you put my name in? And we be, we've been great friends ever since. You know I mean? He didn't, I wasn't trying to, I just was, thought it was such a fabulous photograph. And he was so happy that I used it. He was like, geez, I'm honored that you used my yeah. photograph, you know? So that had a happy ending, unlike certain right. other ones. I, uh, you were, I think, the second guy I ever talked to or tried to interview in my radio career. Um, it, well, no certainly kidding. the second band that I ever introduced from a stage. Now, I was working in Brandon, and this would be late 83 or early 84, and there was a place up on the hill. I can't remember what the place was called, but the first band I ever introduced from the stage was Boys Brigade, another band of Toronto oh, that, yeah, sure. you know, produced yeah. by Geddy Lee and yeah. on Anthem. You were the second. And I was very interested in talking to you after the show because I had been in a three-piece band playing drums and we covered Sweet Thing. And we oh, could cool. not figure out, come up to my, what, a cup of tea and some what? What? Uh, well, lizard lizard fuel is what it is, but we I don't think no, we we're not going to go there. there. But you were the, you, you you were the one that actually broke the logjam for me and my 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 buddy who was who was singing because we we, we couldn't figure out what you were talking about, and uh, he was so relieved to finally figure out what the lyrics and sweet thing were all about. 
So last week I got a message from a guy who wants to cover my song from the Act of God album called Sign on the Line, which started life out as a letter that I wrote to Tim Harold, who was the president of Polygram at the time. And the catchphrase was, you can't deal with record execute jives. <laughs> And we were dropped from the label a week after he got the letter. But this guy wanted to, to you know, he says, this is it based on a true story? I said, well, as a matter of fact, it is. You know, I wrote this stupid letter to the, you know, complaining about our treatment at the hands of the execute jives, as I call them. We got, we got bounced from the label. But I said, I'll tell you what, you write out the lyrics what you think they are, and I'll correct them. And he wasn't even close. And I was singing in pretty articulated English on that <laughs> record. So it's funny how people hear things. So you know? when did when did Gatto sort of was it after Pretty Bad Boys? Did you guys pack it in? No, we we went along for a while. We tried to finally get into the States. They sent us to the States. Wait, wait, but the problem you, was I mean, the like, this wouldn't be Polydor, this would be somebody this is Attic, right? Okay. Manage, management. By this time okay. we were with Attic. Pretty Bad Boys came out on Attic, and then The Best Seat in the House, the live album, double album, came out on uh, Attic. Uh, but the thing is with management, and I, I'm not casting aspersions here, we were making so much money. I mean, you know, by this point, we were playing like uh, McEwen Hall in Calgary or the Max Bell Arena and putting 7,000 people in a small arena, you know. So why send a band that's making generating that kind of capital – to America to play for three hundred dollars a night when you can just keep milking the cow, you know. So our our tours of America were terrible. Plus, we were so chemically and alcoholically imbalanced oh, by did, that point. I we did didn't even know. Say that. We didn't even know yeah. where we were. So, uh, did you did you ever have any meaningful success in in, in America? We had pockets of uh, acceptance, you know, border border pockets, Detroit. Buffalo, that kind of, mm. Windsor, you know, Detroit. Uh, but going into the Deep South, I mean, you know, first of all, we, we did the Cardi's chain in Houston and Dallas and Austin and that, and we opened for the Grassroots. Okay, now, I love the it's Grassroots, a, but you're putting yeah. Gatto on three maniacs playing at warp volume before these guys come on and do in their little power pop songs was not a good choice of opening act. But the drummer in ZZ Top came to see us when we played in uh, Houston. And he he liked what we were doing, which makes sense because, you know, we were a power mm -hmm. trio just like they were. So, yeah, it sounds like Tragically Hip and the Rush story. You know, border cities like Cleveland, uh, oh, yeah. Buffalo, uh, Chicago, then down in Texas. There's something about power trios in Canada and, and Texas. Rush did well there. Triumph did well there. You guys did well there. Moxie. Moxie did well there. Yeah. Moxie, too. Moxie are still huge in Texas. They they can go down. I think Earl takes what what passes for Moxie now. And knowing Earl is probably still a great band. Uh, they go down once a year and they play for ten thousand people. But they can't get arrested here, you know. So that's that's the music business. And now, of course, there is no music business. You wanna, so we're nobody's running going out of time. Do you want to talk about that? Your your views on the music business right now? Because you know who's gonna who's gonna drop you now. Yeah, well, I mean, we have, to, I'm very fortunate in the fact that I can write, you know, so like I'm, I'm biding my time until this is over by writing another book, which instead of taking six years, like this one took to write, I'll have this book done in a year because I got lots of time on my hands. It's a, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy not for guys like me who have had a career for 57 years and did everything I set out to do, traveled the world, you know, played, met the Beatles and the Stones and all the rest of that stuff. I've had an incredible career. I feel sorry for the young kids now that haven't are not going to have those opportunities because of the pandemic. I mean, if they reopen the clubs next week, I have to be quite honest. Would I go and play in them? No, I wouldn't. Would I go to a club to see a band? No, I wouldn't. Same with baseball. I mean, I, you know, as you know, I'm a big Blue Jays fan. I don't think I'll ever sit in a ballpark again. You know, I mean, this is what has happened to our society and the world in general, that, that the music business is basically finished. My, my gal worked for Westbury National Show Systems, the biggest production company, one of the biggest in North America, 500 employees, 
all of them out of work. That's that's it our is. new reality. All right. Let's plug the books again. Hold them up. So Travels with yeah. My Amp, which yes. came out when? Uh, 2011. Okay, it's, it's done well. I mean, uh, it's... This one. And then this one just right. came out at Christmas. Uh, we, we have a website. Uh, it's just shopgreggodovitz.com. Um, usually we have it on a crawl, but I did, we, this is a new format for us. But they're on there. Or people can find me on Facebook and, and, and read where they can order them. But we have, a, we have a, all, the, all the albums came out. When you were talking about the first Gatto album, uh, my good friend Eddie Kramer, who, of course, did yeah. all the Jimi Hendrix music and everybody, Kiss and Led Zeppelin, uh, he remixed the Gatto album oh, the first one. from scratch. So it, it, it sounds one. better? And it sounds phenomenal. It sounds like Led Zeppelin with me <laughs> singing. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, now there's like a bass guitar involved and there's like big drums, you know. And, of course, everything is panned. Now, on my on my uh, Greg Godovich YouTube channel, you can actually find the Eddie Kramer remix. And I, I'd hi hardly recommend people use headphones when they listen because, of course, Eddie, Eddie's yeah. always known for that panning thing you do with Jimmy's guitars, you know. And I'm sitting in the studio watching, and I, I'm thinking to myself, I can't believe that I know this guy, and he's actually mixing an album for me, you know, as a gift. And, and people say, we go on holiday and stuff now together, and people say to me, like, you must pick his brain like crazy. I said, no, not at all. He said, well, what do you talk to him about? I say, Eddie, you're putting too much garlic in the <laughs> Italian spaghetti sauce here, you know. That's what we, we talk about normal and things. Finally, there's a radio show that you're thinking about bringing back. Let's uh, maybe tease that a little bit. Yeah, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I had Rock Talk on CFRB in the AM, a talk radio in Toronto for two years before I left for Calgary. And I kept all the contacts. So in the last week, I decided that I'm going to bring the Rock Talk podcast back in late April. And I've already lined up. Uh, Eddie Kramer is going to do the first show. Uh, Larry Gowan is a, a, a neighbor of mine. He popped over the other day to pick up a copy of my new book. And I corralled him into agreeing to doing the second show. And my buddy Steve Lukather from Toto, who plays with Ringo Starr's band, and introduced me to Ringo a couple years ago, which was nice. He's going to be the third guest. So I, I'm shooting high. I'm going to get. I'm going to go after Eric Burden and Ro Roger McGuinn. And End of April, you say? End of April, Rock Talk, the podcast. And, and we, we will have announcements. If, if, the, if the folks that are watching go to uh, uh, to the Greg Godovitz YouTube channel, we'll, we'll have a lot of updates on when it's coming because that's where it's going to be broadcast. Well, thank you very much for taking the time, Greg. Happy birthday. I know that you've got a bunch of uh, Facebook message, messages that you got to get through. When do you think we'll see the third book? Before Christmas. It's, and it's called The Idiot's Trilogy Part 4. So that's what, you'll figure that one out. But I, I want to tell you, you know, when they asked me to do this, I said I would do it on condition that Alan Cross interviews me because you are the governor. And I, I just want you to know that this is a well, great honor. You know, Greg, I got into playing a lot of your stuff when I was still in university. I mean, covering it. So this is kind of cool for me, too. Well, this is great, man. And I, I know we did this live two years ago, and I hope next year oh, we get please. to do this again. Please, please, live. please. I am just, I, well, you know. You guys stay safe out there. Wear your masks. And uh, Mark, a, a big shout out to you for putting this thing together. You're a champion of live music and musicians. And on behalf of them, I thank Same thing you for me. That. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, guys.